name is Kate Rock. I'm part of the team at HRL Laboratory studying quantum dots. This is the second half of a two-part talk about a pulse spectroscopy method we developed to measure the value orbit excited states of silicon, silicon, germanium quantum dots. So we study exchange only triple quantum dots in spin qubits in silicon, silicon, germanium heterostructures. This upper left image is a false color SEM of a six dot device with overlapping gates. The green regions are the electron baths. M1 and M2 are the dot charge sensors, which measure the charge state. The Ts are the tunneling gates, which control the tunneling from the electron bath to the dot array. The Ps are the plunger gates, underneath which the individual electrons live. And the Xs are the exchange gates, which control the height of the tunnel barriers between the dots. Um, initialization and readout are um, known to be affected by low-lying excitations in silicon dots. For more information on our initialization and readout, I encourage you to go hear Jacob Blumoff's um, talk on um, state prep and measurement. Where the valley orbit excited states are in our dots depends on the disorder present at the quantum well interface, as well as on the electrostatic confinement potential. We want to know exactly where these states are in order to provide good feedback to our epitaxial growth team. As Andrew mentioned, there are already several techniques in existence to measure the excited state energies of dots. What we'd really like, however, is a way to measure the energy spectra using our typical qubit operating techniques, which rely on DC baseband pulses as well as low magnetic fields. So we developed DAPS, Detuning Axis Pulse Spectroscopy, to measure the energy spectra of dots. Andrew's talk focused on the time dynamics, and this talk will focus on the energy spectra. DAPS is performed on a um, pair of dots where one dot is coupled to the bath. I'll explain it for this P6, P5 dot pair, and I'm going to start with how we probe the splitting of the P5 dot. Uh, this plot on the lower left is the charge stability diagram. The black region is both of our dots empty. The dark gray region is a single electron in P6, and the light gray region is a single electron in P5. A, B, and C mark the key locations in voltage space for DAPS. So step one is to sit at A, the P601 charge boundary, and prepare our electron in the P6 ground valley state. Step two is to move to B squarely into the 1,0 charge cell and measure the reference current, which is the current associated with a single electron in P6. Now I want to move to energy versus detuning so that we can understand what happens in energy space as we're moving around in voltage space. So this plot in the upper right is energy as a function of our detuning axis, where towards the right is P6 occupied and towards the left is P5 occupied. Um, the black lines are the P5 energy uh, levels, ground and valley, and the blue lines are the P6 energy levels, ground, valley, orbital, and orbitals valley. So we are, so we prepared our electron in the P6 ground state. We moved to B and um, we are here on the energy versus detuning and we measure our reference current. The third step is to jump to a point along the detuning axis, which I've drawn at an anti-crossing here for illustration purposes. So we jump, we stay there for a time t hold, and we dephase into a mixed state. Step four is to return to B and again measure our current. So if the electron is in the P6 ground state when we come back to B, We'll measure, the electron will fall into the P6 dot and we'll measure the current associated with a single electron in P6. When we subtract that from our reference current, we get zero, no signal. And if instead the electron is in the P5 excited valley state, when we move back to B, the electron will not fall into P6 and we'll measure the current associated with a single electron in P5. When we subtract that from our reference current, we get a non-zero value and this is our signal. We repeat this single shot measurement several times in average. Implicit in this energy versus detuning explanation um, was a key assumption about the time dynamics necessary for this experiment to work. In particular, we need to be able to measure faster than the time it takes for the charge state to decay. So we need to be in the limit of fast measurement time and low tunnel coupling. Okay. And just to round up the, the recipe here, um, we also step C all along the detuning axis in order to map out each anti-crossing. And um, how, pronounced each, how pronounced the signal is depends on how long we hold the electron at C. So we also sweep T hold. Experiment for um, measuring the uh, splitting for the P6 dot, similar to that of P5, with the exception of this step we've added in purple, which is an adiabatic ramp to transfer the electron to the P5 ground valley state. 
So this is our charge stability diagram. Again, we've got one additional key location in voltage space, B prime. Um, step one is the same. We sit at A and prepare our electron in the P6 ground valley state. Um, step two is to move to B. So we are here in the energy versus detuning. This is the new part. Um, we're going to ramp adiabatically from the P6 ground state slowly through the ground ground anti-crossing and transfer our, our electron into the P5 ground valley state. Now we measure the current here at B prime, and we get the current associated with a single electron in P5. Um, step three is the same. We jump to a point along detuning. We stay there for a time T hold, and we dephase into a mixed state. Step four is to move back to B prime and again measure the current. If, it, if the electron's in the P5 ground valley state when we move back, sorry, if it's in the P5 ground state when we move back to B prime, we'll measure zero net current. If it's instead in the P6 excited valley state when we move back to B prime, we will get a signal. And again, we um, repeat the single shot measurement several times, average, we step C all along the detuning axis, and we also sweep T hold. So this is a DAPS measurement of the P6 dot energy spectrum. Uh, to interpret this data, we come back to our energy versus detuning diagram from the previous slide, where the black line here is the P5 ground level, and the P6 levels are blue. So in the lower left is the P6 ground valley, then it's first orbital, first orbital's valley, second orbital, and second orbital's valley. Um, the top plot is the normalized DAPS current signal we measure. Uh, away from the anticrossings, we get no signal. And we've aligned each DAPS peak with its inferred anticrossing. The green trace is holding the electron at each point along detuning for 0.2 microseconds. And the blue trace is holding there for 5 microseconds. Um, note it's easier to resolve the location of the first orbital peak uh, at the shorter hold time, while the valley peaks are easier to resolve at the longer hold time. So we also sweep T hold, and we get this plot. Um, we have converted the, sorry, again, we've aligned the inferred anticrossings up with their DAPS, DAPS peaks. And we've converted the x-axis here from detuning voltage to energy using measurements of our lever arm from temperature sweeps. And to extract the energies, we calculate the energy difference between um, the excited anticrossing peaks and the ground ground anticrossing peak. So for this P6 dot, we measure the valley to be 140 microEV. And we measure the two orbital energies to be about 1.4 and 2.1 MeV. These two different values for the orbital energies suggest our confining potential is not symmetric. We measure the orbital's valleys to be about 220 and 150 microEV. The three slightly different valley splitting energies suggest we have a slightly, maybe due to slightly different um, sampling of the quantum well interface disorder. This plot here on the left is a pulse gate spectroscopy measurement on that same P6 dot. The energies we extract from this are summarized here in this table. And they compare well to those energies we measured with DAPS. Um, in addition, we also perform spin blockade spectroscopy on the P6, P5 dot pair. The fit to that data yielded a two electron singlet triplet split splitting of about 140 microEV. Um, this is also what we measured with the single electron um, depths for the single electron valley splitting. And these two numbers agreeing suggest that the two electron singlet triplet splitting in this case is indeed valley limited. So now that we have DAPS to measure valley, we can explore the dependence of the valley splitting on the voltage bias. Um, so we're measuring DAPS on this P6, P5 pair. And we can shape the electrochemical potential of the P6 dots by changing the voltages on their neighboring X gates. So we can shape P6 by changing X5, and we can do P5 by changing X4. So the valley splitting we measure for these two dots are these two plots. Um, as a function of each dot's neighboring gate voltage. We see P5 is quite sensitive to the voltage bias, while P6 is much less so. We attribute the change in the P5 valley splitting to um, the electron wave function sampling different disordered features as we shape the potential. Um, 
Similar observations have been made by other groups. And it was also predicted by theory several years ago. This figure on the lower right is the theoretical change in valley splitting um, one might see as the electron wave function overlaps with a single step in the quantum well interface. Finally, we can also um, explore valley splitting as a function of the silicon well width. The theoretical expe expectation is that the valley splitting should increase as the quantum well width is narrowed. The um, potential downsides of this are a decrease in mobility and an increase in disorder, which may um, make for poor quantum dot performance. So this is the valley splitting we measured for um, two devices as a function of well width. Device one is a three nanometer well width device whose measured valley splittings range from about 50 to 300 micro EV. And device two is an eight nanometer well width device uh, with valley splittings from about 20 to 30 micro EV. They're offset slightly on the X axis, just so you can see there's more than a single data point there. Um, so on average, we see a significant improvement in the, in the valley splitting we measure at the narrower well width. Um, but this large spread we see at the three nanometer, in the three nanometer device is potentially consistent with um, an increase in the overlap of the electron wave function with the disorder at the quantum well interface. So as we expected, the mobility and T2 star are indeed lower uh, in the three nanometer well. Um, but we're still able to achieve good qubit performance. And for more information about three nanometer device performance, I encourage you to go listen to um, Bo Sun's talk and uh, as well as Jacob Blumoff's talk. So DAPS is a simple and powerful technique to measure the valley orbit excited states. Um, it's not limited in, in energy and it also gives us access to time dynamics of our states. Using DAPS to measure valley splitting, we observed a higher average valley splitting for narrower quantum well widths. And we were also able to explore the dependence of the valley splitting on voltage bias.